While I'm not the first to talk about Grouch's TF2 rebalance video, the rest were just critical reactions. Instead, I wish to do a scripted response to explain why almost all the changes, even the reasonable ones, have received pushback. I'll be running this script by some friends of mine as well, two of which are casual players who have played for a long time, and the third is a competitive player of 9v9 and 6v6 for over a decade. Grouch has said in his follow-up spy video that he doesn't want all of these changes implemented into TF2 proper. These aren't meant to be competitive, and it's just for fun. While it's absolutely possible he left out that important information in the original video, his tone, emphasis on what's fair, and consistent reference to good and logical design to back up his changes, paint this more as backtracking when his ideas got pushed back, or at least wanting to have it both ways. But regardless if it was an honest mistake or moving the goalpost, all of these changes do have problems, and it offers me a chance to talk about TF2's weapon balance and design. That's the big reason I'm willing to cover this video over a month after it came out. I want this to be about more than just saying why Grouch is wrong for an hour. I try to make my videos have an appeal beyond just my opinion on a subject, but that goes from a goal to a requirement when responding to another YouTuber. Also, I want to apologize for the length of this video. I try to structure my videos so that way they flow well instead of going with the flow, but since I have something to say on every one of the rebalances and I don't want to risk misquoting him, a point-by-point -point response is the best I can think of. Sorry for the time investment this video asks of you. Finally, while this video was frustrating to get through to script this, Grouch did take this on the chin. He didn't get in the fights, claim being an indie dev gives him superior knowledge, or try to tell people they don't understand the game like he does. So, while there's some jabs here and there for some humor, there's nothing personal, and if anything, I respect his professionalism about this. With all that said, let's begin. I fixed 30 of Team Fortress 2's most broken weapons and set them up on my public server for you to play with, but I have to start by apologizing in advance to any Natasha, Vaccinator, or Kunai fans out there, you're gonna fucking hate this video. Now some people might think that TF2 is perfect and doesn't really need fixing and Ah, uh, who am I kidding? None of you are thinking that. My thinking is that since I can't really do anything to fix the bot problem, I might as well try my hand at fixing some of TF2's other problems. You see, most weapons in TF2 are extremely well balanced. There are, however, still a handful of useless weapons that nobody uses and need to be buffed, as well as a few legitimately overpowered weapons that desperately need a good nerf. And there's also a couple of oddball, annoying weapons that aren't even technically good, but just suck to play against and need to be completely rethought. And there's the premise of the video, 30 weapons being rebalanced on both ends of the spectrum. Before I rip into those, however, I want to throw him a few bones. People mention he's only had 50 hours of gameplay on record, but that could just be the account he used for this channel, and it shouldn't affect his arguments either way. Just as me, not being good at TF2 doesn't make my criticisms here any less valid. A novice can be well observed, a professional can have a limited view. People also point out in the video how he only uses the ideas against bots or his friends being idle, but doing so for demonstration purposes is fair. In theory, anyway. For example, the Natasha is not even a very good weapon, but people still use it for the sheer psychological damage it deals when you have to fight against this thing. It slows down anybody you hit with it, which is really frustrating to play against, so I changed it so that instead of slowing down your enemies, it speeds you up. Heavy's walk speed while revved up with the Natasha is now the same as his normal walk speed. However, he still can't jump or switch weapons quickly, so there is still some incentive to not be revved up all the time. And Heavy is still the slowest class in the game, so he's not going to be chasing you down with this thing, don't worry. But he will be a monster with good positioning. And good positioning is what Heavy is all about. Buffed. Continuing with the Heavy, we've got the Brass Beast, which I think is pretty underrated. Yeah, it sucks being super slow to rev up and move, but that extra 20% damage is really nothing to sneeze at. This weapon is great when you're already revved up, but since it takes so long to rev up, it makes repositioning pretty dangerous. If you need some ammo or a health pack, you better have a shotgun handy because the Brass Beast is just too slow to protect you while you're walking from point A to point B. To help with this, I simply doubled the minigun's ammo capacity. The weapon that makes it hard to reposition safely now gives you some extra time before you need to reposition. Buffed. And for the final minigun change, the Huo Long Heater. I personally love the concept of this weapon, but let's face it, it's flat out useless. 
The Rings of Fire are a great gimmick, but losing 4 ammo a second to produce them is a mighty price to pay, and it doesn't end up being worth it 95% of the time. It only does 12.5% more damage to burning players, and they're usually only burning if they're already up in your face, which means that any minigun would really tear them apart anyways. At mid-range, the damage bonus is nice, but it's not worth coordinating with your team's pyro just for that 12.5% more damage. I think this weapon should really encourage the heavy to link up with a friendly pyro for a crazy two-man team, but in its current state, it just doesn't do that. It's too normal. It feels like a normal minigun with less ammo. It's a little less damage most of the time and a little more damage sometimes, but nothing stands out about this weapon other than the Rings of Fire, which granted are epic as hell. I decided to increase the damage penalty to minus 25% so it's harder to fight non-burning players, and instead of doing 25% more damage to burning players, it does 33% more damage in the form of mini crits, which end up turning into the normal minigun damage when combined with that minus 25% damage penalty because of math. So what's the point? Well, mini crits are unaffected by damage falloff, so fighting a burning target close up won't really be any different. But fighting a burning target at mid-range or long range will be absolute hell for them. I'm hoping this will give the Huo Long Heater a more specialized role in the game, but since I haven't actually used these weapons in an actual match before, I'd love for you guys to play on the server yourself and tell me what you think. Buffed. Okay, let's break these down. First, the Natasha. Widely considered Heavy's worst minigun, his rebalance at first glance seems reasonable speed the player up instead of slowing the enemy down. Ideally achieves the same result, and isn't annoying the fight against. Except, that's not true. You see, the slowdown gives the heavy a counter to scout mobility, stops demo night charges, and can force blast jumping classes to be grounded and sometimes even crater. That's on top of simply firing at enemies fighting your teammates, holding them in their tracks, and letting your team pin them down more easily. But this comes at the cost of 25% lower damage, and it has a 30% slower rev up. So Heavy makes himself more of a support and defense role, rather than the offensive role he's taken over the years. And Grouch removes all of those tactical options just so you cannot slow down when revved up. I know that's a big deal for Heavy, but losing a fourth of your damage output just so you can dodge a few more rockets or try to get close for max ramp up is a heavy price to pay, on top of losing all of the support and secondary impacts I just mentioned. And most heavy mains have already learned to work around his low movement speed when revved up. Yet guess what? The new version was apparently so OP, he had to make it, according to the follow-up video and the doc, that the rev-up speed is even slower on par with the Brass Beast, he removed the damage resistance at half health, and holding the weapon now triggers the max health drain that the Gru and the Eviction Notice give. Not revving the gun up, but simply holding it out. You have to fat scout with this thing, or you live on borrowed time. A reminder, he said the slowdown, something that can only affect enemies you're actively landing your shots on, was not fun to play against, but is so determined to stick with this version after it was proven to be busted, that he had to give it some of the worst downsides you can give any heavy weapon, on top of it having the lowest damage of a minigun. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the Brass Beast getting an extra 100% ammo. He says 200% on the dock, but I'm going to assume slash hope that's a typo. Frankly, it's a meaningless stat for most players, as it doesn't actually fix the key issues the Brass Beast faces. People don't use this because it's too slow to rev up, so you need to be preemptive when using it. But you're so slow when using it that you're a sitting duck with anything with decent range or good burst damage. That 200% might not have been a typo, because frankly 600 ammo is no different than 400 or 200. Buffing the ammo really isn't going to fix anything. Why do you think people only use this in payload, near a dispenser, or an MVM? Because all of them take movement out of the equation. The payload cart pushes you forward, the nest gives you a spot to defend, an MVM has the enemies come straight to you. Finally, there's the Hulong Heater. This section's weird. He correctly points out the problem the gun has. It's just a worse version of stock. You functionally have less ammo, you do less damage most of the time, and you're reliant on a friendly pyro. So naturally, he makes the damage even worse, makes your peak damage at best on par with stock, and requires you to be at mid to long range with a friendly pyro to achieve anything beyond stock, making the Ring of Fire go from practically pointless to literally pointless. He doesn't even give it the Tommy Slav accuracy for that long range assistance. 
the big problem with his buff is what he said in the video. He wanted this to be a situational weapon. A primary being situational isn't something to encourage in the first place, but this is perhaps the worst example it could be outside of the Pompson. Its upside is incredibly situational, while its downside is ever-present. You're not going to always have a friendly pyro. Said pyro will not always be cooperative. The pyro that does work with you won't always be using the degreaser, so he'll often just kill the target without your help. You won't always be at mid to long range when the pyro doesn't melt them in 4 seconds, meaning you don't really get a damage buff. And you won't always land your shots at that beneficial distance, even if it did have the Tomislav's accuracy buff. But you will always deal 25% less damage, and revving up will always chew through your ammo. Also, in what world is the slowdown from Natasha too unfair to fight against? Yet a heavy gang stalking his pyro to snipe at someone who's already having to face the highest DPS class in the game is something to encourage. So to recap, the tactical mid-range minigun, which was deemed too unfair to be allowed to exist, was turned into a gun only good for dodging rockets or getting max ramp up, and was apparently so OP it has to kill you for merely holding it. The high damage minigun that's too slow to use in normal gameplay gets double ammo to encourage you to stay revved up and slow longer. Meanwhile, the ammo-challenged Furnace now deals even less damage and encourages the Heavy to stay out of his effective range just to help a class that realistically doesn't need it. They're all awful in their own unique way. In the first four minutes of this video, you get a taste of the problem almost every rebalance has. It either fails to address the core issue, considers a functionally worse version of the weapon a buff because there's a single situation it might achieve something, and or has contradicting design principles to his own reasoning. Ugh, this is gonna be fun. Now for some sandwiches. The buffalo steak sandwich is now eaten twice as fast and deploys and holsters a good bit faster too, allowing for high damage melee heavy to be less of a premeditated gimmick and more of a spur of the moment plot twist during a team fight. Buffed. And the Delocus bar is now eaten four times faster and deploys and holsters significantly faster, making it more of a mid-battle snack rather than a full course meal. I've always thought it was the weakest sandwich since it only heals a small fraction of your health and that 50 bonus health might seem nice, but it doesn't actually increase your overheal capacity, so if you're using a medic on your team, which you should be, it kind of becomes useless. This new design will allow Heavy to take multiple bites pretty much back to back and will allow him to cut his snack time short anytime he likes to jump back into battle. It still increases your max health and it still doesn't heal much, but now it's way harder to be caught with your pants down like with the other sandwiches. Buffed. Okay, a bit of a palate cleanser. These are not bad. Allowing the buffalo steak sandwich to be used reactively when needed or using the chocolate instantly are nice extras. However, while not pointless like the Brass Beast extra ammo, neither buff fixes the big issue holding the weapons back. In the case of the ribeye, it's the unlabeled 20% extra damage taken during rage inflicted upon heavy. Locking him to melee certainly isn't helping, it should be possible to make the mini crits only apply to melee weapons for the duration, but him being locked to melee and taking extra damage is a heavy price to pay when Heavy doesn't get the support Demo Knight does. It also lacks any health recovery, which makes him far less self-sufficient, probably because it's meant to be paired with the Warrior Spirit and its health on kill mechanic. The Dilokas Bar, on the other hand, may have been nerfed instead of buffed. Judging from the gameplay, it now only heals 50 HP instead of 100, and recharges in 6 seconds instead of 10. This means it takes 24 seconds to recover 200 health, something the second banana can do in a single 10 second charge. And if he waited another 6 seconds, the Heavy would have been able to recharge a sandwich for a full heal. And the healing process of that can protect him from some very hairy situations. I'm going to saw through your bone! <laughs> the chocolate still requires constant stopping and finding cover, even if it's technically eaten in an instant. And there aren't many situations where recovering 50 health will make a big difference since a Spy's Revolver can do that kind of damage with a bit of damage ramp up in one shot. Or, you know, he could just fire it twice. While letting the Chocolate Bar be a quicker snack is fine, it's meant to be used preemptively to get the edge on a direct fight without being unfair, and that angle needs to be stronger to make it better than a full heal in a pinch or 200 health on command. So again, the actual problem has not been fixed. 
And for our last heavy change, I tried to do something us heavy fans have been wanting for a long time, a heavy subclass. If you don't know, a subclass is basically any weapon or combination of weapons that radically changes how a class is played while still allowing them to fill their niche role. Think Huntsman Snipers, Demo Knights, and Battle Engineers. Heavy has never had a true subclass, so here's my attempt. The Big Business, previously known as the Family Business. What once was a slightly different shotgun side grade is now a complete and total death machine on par with Heavy's miniguns. It still has 7 shots in the clip, but instead of boringly just firing a little faster and doing a little less damage, it gives Heavy a speed boost anytime he hits an enemy with the thing. And if he eliminates the enemy entirely, they'll drop a small health pack that Heavy can swoop in and grab with a speed boost. Fat Scout has arrived. Tell your friends. Now obviously this is a direct upgrade from the normal shotgun so far. And it is a direct upgrade to the normal shotgun. Until you switch to your minigun and realize that 75% of your ammo is gone. Permanently. Which means no spam fire, no busting up sentries, and 75% less ammo from all ammo packs and dispensers. You've really got to use your minigun sparingly, if at all, if you're going to run the big business. Buff. I applaud the effort here. Grouch correctly notices the Fat Scout needs to be more mobile and maintain survivability, and works them into the weapon's upsides. Sadly, the other big problem with Fat Scout is that you functionally only have a shotgun. The Fat Scout typically ignores his minigun to keep his shotgun out at all times, and Heavy only has three particularly good melee options in the first place. But his downside of 75% less minigun ammo turns that lack of a secondary gun from a mindset into a hard restriction only encouraging heavies to stick to nothing but the shotgun, and occasionally the KGB. That's the big problem that this fails to fix, and in fact makes worse. This isn't Fat Scout, it's Shotgun Heavy. Unlike Scout, you have no secondary attack option for mid to longer ranges, the minigun is too slow to be used as a secondary, and now it's too limited to be an alternative. He doesn't have any of the built-in support that a class like, let's say, the Combat Engineer or even the Standard Texan gets, nor is he versatile enough to take advantage of his melee options like a Demo Knight could. At the end of the day, you're just a heavy not playing to his strengths, and Grouch's big business shotgun requires you to play COD Kill Confirm to do what the lunchbox items already do naturally. If Fat Scout is ever going to work, the heavy needs a proper primary and secondary. I don't know if any fan server can implement this, but I do have a solution. When the heavy equips a lunchbox item, then, and only then, the Heavy can pick a shotgun for his primary. This would allow the Fat Scout to be a durable burst fire class that can heal himself or at least give his lunchbox to his medic. And even then, the lack of defensive secondaries and limited mobility could be an issue. So yes, I don't think this fixes the Fat Scout problem, but it wasn't from a lack of effort, and this isn't something you can solve with a single weapon stats. Sadly, I can't say this is a buff to the weapon itself either. The Family Business and the Tomislav are already the best Fat Scout combo in the game, since the Tomislav revs up faster. This allows it to serve as a secondary, albeit a slow one, and you can also go back to being a heavy on short notice if you need to. His version, however, locks you into being just a shotgun heavy with upsides that only help you in a one-on-one -on -one fight, where heavy already excels. Alright, well that was fun talking about Heavy and all the goodies he got for Christmas this year, but buffs aren't the only thing I'm dishing out today. It's time to move on to a class that has had it too good for too long. These nerfs are long overdue. Some of you are gonna love this, and just as many are probably gonna hate it, but let's just face the facts, it has to be done. It's time to nerf the sniper. All sniper rifles have their primary ammo capacity cut in half, and now fire tracer rounds. Stealth is Spy's thing. I'm sick and tired of snipers hiding in the shadows getting cross-map insta-kills without anybody knowing where they are. And you might say that good communication fixes the problem of stealthy snipers, but it really does not. First of all, good communication is supposed to be Spy's counter. Sniper's counter is supposed to be good positioning, you know, staying out of his sight lines. And how are you supposed to position yourself accordingly if you don't know where the sniper even is? You can't expect an entire team to know every map's callouts just to deal with snipers. Calling out a spy is effortless. Spy is heavy, spy on carts, spy on sentry, spy at spawn, but snipers don't stick to landmark locations like carts or sentries. They could be anywhere on the entire map. If you're on Badwater and you say sniper on rocks, 
That could literally mean like four different things, and since they're a long range class and Spy is a short range class, actually getting to the position takes time, so they have a longer time to reposition than a Spy does. And so the Stealth Pick class, Spy, is easier to pinpoint verbally than the non-Stealth Pick class, Sniper. That is a massive fucking problem. If a Spy kills you without you ever seeing him or knowing he exists, you think, Man, what a good spy player. If a sniper kills you without you ever seeing him or knowing he exists, you think, well that's an annoying spot, how am I supposed to fight against that? I say, no more, I've just had enough. The reduced ammo will force sniper to reposition more often or pick sniping spots in your ammo packs, making it easier to spot snipers and kill them while they reposition, and make it easier to predict where a sniper might be camping out at. The tracer rounds will also encourage a sniper to reposition more often so he's less predictable and allows players to actively consider enemy sniper sightlines during combat instead of just being in the middle of a teamfight and getting your head blown off out of nowhere. Because you get to see all the shots the sniper hits, and the ones he misses, you're able to perform a little bit of mental calculus to deduce just how accurate this guy really is, what targets he's prioritizing, and what all he's really able to see from his position. Nerfed, 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 nerfed. Salt is bad for the heart. So first, voice chat isn't just a counter for spy. It's a teamwork tool for any and all situations. And acting like it's meant to counter a single class specifically is incredibly stupid. Also, callouts aren't meant to replace situational awareness. Even if you don't know the exact rock the sniper is at, you'll know there's a sniper with high ground over there. And you can just clarify where exactly that is if you need to. Towards the base, the cliffside, the fence, and that's putting aside for the fact that there is a favorite rock for snipers to always go on. And putting that aside, people might actually learn the callout spots if people use them. This is why people aren't immediately for every single sniper round having tracer shots. I personally think it's fair. But should sniper be collectively nerfed because common players don't communicate? That's a big question that needs to be thought about and simply repeating Sniper is not the stealth class isn't a convincing argument, especially when it comes off as someone refusing to learn the typical Sniper sightlines, and then claiming it's unreasonable to expect someone to learn something that players have been figuring out for 15 years. And that's the change I can get behind. The ammo nerf is total overkill. If the Sniper is going to have Tracer rounds, he's already going to have to be forced to relocate to deal with the additional pressure he should be receiving from being so easy to pin down. If the opposing team is unable or unwilling to deal with him, why should the sniper be punished with less ammo? I don't even like sniper in this game, but this rebalance comes off as making the sniper remove himself from fights just because your team can't or won't. And now it's time for the old switcheroo, the Hitman's Heatmaker, which is the exception to literally everything I just said because this guy does not fire tracer rounds unless the focus ability is activated. I did, however, increase the body shot damage penalty from minus 20% to minus 66%. A normal sniper rifle does 150 damage on a fully charged body shot, and the Hitman's Heatmaker does 50. It is the weapon of the tryhards. If you're a truly elite sniper who never misses a shot, you won't notice any of the sniper nerfs as long as you use this weapon. But if you think this weapon sucks, then I have one recommendation for you. Get good. Nerfed. And if you're somebody who thinks about game design sometimes, you probably know that by giving every sniper rifle tracer rounds, it inadvertently buffs the Machina, which used to be the only rifle to have that downside. Which is why the Machina now slows down your move speed just a little bit to make up for all the extra damage you get to do. Nerfed. Get good, huh? Bold words for someone skill-checked by voice chat. Now, everyone has pointed out that allowing the Heatman's Heatmaker to shoot silently without the tracer rounds completely defeats the point of having that nerf. So allow me to make a different point. This isn't rebalancing a broken class, this is punishing anyone who isn't a god at Sniper. If you want to have an element of surprise, you have to be a headshot tryhard with this one rifle, or you have to deal with no surprise whatsoever. You reward the very kind of snipers that caused the salt fueling this entire section to begin with, while punishing average and new snipers by forcing them to either constantly give their position away, or have no room for error. And this comes with the extra benefit of making the bizarre bargain almost worthless, because the ammo nerf now means getting your 7 headshots depletes you of most of your reserves. Also, why give the stealth shots to the Heatmaker? Give it to the Classic and the Sydney Sleeper, the two actually weak rifles. 
The former doesn't have the ability to quickscope, and the latter can't properly headshot, so letting them keep the element of surprise would give them the edge they honestly need. I'm not covering the change he did to the Machina because he backtracked on it in the follow-up, so I think it's fair to just leave that alone. As it currently stands, Grouch's rebalance of sniper punishes average snipers who want stealth and body shots, gives expert snipers a workaround so they can keep doing the very thing he complained about, and used to justify this nerf, made it so that the sniper now has an objectively best sniper rifle once you hit a certain skill threshold, and it makes it harder for new players to learn how to play sniper because there's very little room for error, and the tracer rounds and limited ammo make it hard for new players to actually get good at sniper. This isn't based. It's stupid. And now that I'm done being the bearer of based news, it's time to get to the fun stuff. Sniper's secondaries. I'll start with the smallest change, the cleaner's carbine, which now has highly increased accuracy to make it more of a mid-range finisher weapon, distinguishing it from the SMG's close-range capabilities. Buffed. Oh, and remember how fucking boring the Darwin's Danger Shield is? I mean, come on, fire resistance? Who cares? Instead of just giving some bland damage resistance to counter one random class in the game, I'm reinventing this item into what I call the Forester's Frog Skin. It'll protect you from danger, sure, but not by passively shielding you from one random class in the game. Instead, this thing gives you increased move speed, massively increased jump height, and 25 less max health. Remember what I said about wanting Sniper to reposition more? This thing will let you do that and then some. You can reposition yourself right in front of some dude's face and lodge an arrow into it, or simply jump back and forth between health packs and high ground. You can now go where no Sniper has ever gone before. Nobody will see it coming, but they will be able to react strategically due to the tracer rounds, unless you use the heat maker, in which case I think I may have just unleashed the mother of all tryhards. Buff. The Razorback is getting a similar treatment. Instead of shielding you through mobility, this one actually will shield you passively. Not being able to be overhealed was kinda stupid, so I removed it. I understand why it was there, it was to prevent a sniper from being able to tank a bunch of revolver shots through the overheal while simultaneously being immune to backstabs. But don't worry, because I've removed the backstab immunity. It still discourages backstabs though, because it soaks your stabber in Jurati for 8 seconds, so if you're playing around your team, you are sure to be avenged quickly after your death. It also increases your max health by 25 like the Danger Shield used to. Now it's harder for a spy to stab you, and harder for him to shoot you to death, but both are still possible, unlike with the old Razorback, where it forced spies to use their revolver. The health bonus also means you get a little bit more out of health packs and can be overhealed to 225 health, which I think will combo nicely with the Huntsman and hopefully won't be too unfair to fight against. I mean, surely a pocket soldier is still going to be more dangerous than a pocket Huntsman sniper, right? I've also been calling this one the Wet Blanket instead of the Razorback because I just imagined Sniper wearing a huge pea-soaked blanket on his back that coats spies in Jurati for stabbing him. Nerfed, but only kind of. And now for the Cozy Camper, which is exactly the same as it used to be, except that it now puts your max ammo to a whopping 40, so that you can, you know, camp. If you somehow manage to surf a rocket into a crazy good sniping position, the Cozy Camper will let you heal back up, like normal, and keep you well stocked up on ammo. Buffed. Okay. At least this calms down a bit with the cleaner's carbine. This falls in line with the lunchbox buffs in that it'd be a welcome change, but doesn't fix the actual problem. Namely, the mini crits are too slow to build up off of SMG damage alone, especially with that slower firing speed and smaller magazines. The extra accuracy would be nice, but most snipers would rather just go for a quick scope at that point. And with the danger shield, we get back to stupid. Changing a weapon because you find it boring is a dumb mentality in a PvE game, and a flawed approach for game design in the first place. And a flawed approach in the first place. Moreover, fire damage is not from some random class, but it's meant to be a defense against one of Sniper's counterpicks in modern TF2, the Pyro. All of the flare guns have the range to attack the Sniper on short notice, and are fast enough to force Sniper to unscope if he wants to dodge it. The flare gun two-hit combo can kill the Sniper outright, a single stored crit of the Man Melter puts the Sniper on borrowed time, the detonator can explode mid-flight if the sniper is in an open area, making dodging it almost impossible, and the same can be true for the Scorch Shot, except when it makes contact with a wall, and a direct hit from that can cause knockback, disrupting his sightline. Between all of that and a jetpack that lets the pyro close the distance, snipers are very justified to be worried about fire damage. And then there's the super jump. No. By his own logic, no. 
If we have to give Trace a rounds and nerf the ammo in half because people go, how am I supposed to play against a sniper from that angle? Why would you give him the means to turn any piece of level geometry into a perch? Let alone letting a Huntsman Sniper get onto a rooftop with ease, and within one second of charging, having a 360 degree damage headshot to kill anything besides an overhealed heavy. The very problem he said that made Sniper OP is now worse than ever. Congratulations, you played yourself. The Razorback change especially hurts because the extra health would help the Tribal Shield and make it more than just an anti-spy weapon. But then you remove the anti-spy effect it has? According to the Google document, the spy isn't even locked up after a backstab, so he can still counter the Jurati with the Dead Ringer. Sure, it won't remove it, but the speed boost and damage resistance is all he'll need, and every cloak in the game cuts down on Jurati time anyway. And if you think being killed by teammates will deter the spy, assuming there's even teammates around you, you know that not being able to backstab never stopped the spy from killing a sniper. Right? Some people think the Razorback is pointless since spies can just shoot you anyway, but at least you get a chance, man! Oh! Admirable shot. He lowered the extra ammo that he'd have the cozy camper give back to the original 25 in the follow up, but the criticisms everyone already pointed out of how it just undoes the sniper rebalance still holds up. So instead, I want to point out what many have missed. Sniper rifles are just now worse versions of the Huntsman. The bow and arrow has half the ammo and more limited range compared to a rifle, but is faster and more mobile in terms of combat. His rifle rebalance is to force, not encourage, but force, Sniper to constantly reposition himself, either through enemy aggression or looking for ammo. The Sniper can use the Heat Maker to avoid that, but he has to give up body shot damage, he can't take advantage of the focus meter without getting the tracer rounds, and he has more limited options in terms of secondaries. So if you don't feel like using the all-or-nothing rifle and the handful of weapons that synergize well with his version of it, the Huntsman is your best bet because it complements the playstyle the game is forcing you into. It no longer has a meaningful ammo reduction because the rifles only have a single shot more. It charges in one second instead of three and a half. It's still remarkably accurate at long ranges with a predictable arc. It's better at close range defense. The arrows don't give your position away as badly as the tracer rounds do and can still kill most classes in a single fully charged shot. Headshot, that is. Only overhealed heavies can withstand a full blow to the head, and that'll still bring them down to death's door. And in the time it would take to fully charge a sniper rifle, you can fully charge and release two Huntsman arrows, which can kill a heavy in two headshots no matter what. The Huntsman also just combos really well with all of Sniper's secondaries. With the Heatmaker, it comes down to three options. Either the Jurati with the Bushwhacker for close range defense, because the body damage is so bad you're basically using the Machina, the Cozy Camper to get your ammo back, or the Danger Shield since you have the only rifle that can maintain the element of surprise from those bizarre angles. The Huntsman receives all of those buffs, and then some. For example, the Cozy Camper now gives you 24 arrows with good defensive capabilities, and the Danger Shield allows the Huntsman, who can instantly kill medics with a one second headshot, to get to any position on the map. In the clip he shows, he could have ended that medic in two seconds and escaped if he got up there undetected. And since the Razorback can't actually stop spies from violating you now, the Huntsman allows the Sniper to be in the front lines where that 25 health makes the most difference, since it's almost meaningless in Sniper mirror matches, and it's the only reliable way for him to be close enough to a medic to get overhealed. Both the Jurati and the Cleanest Carbine grant mini crits, allowing full charge body shots to cross the 150 damage threshold for the arrows, while the SMG is just a good finishing tool that's reliable in just about any situation. Okay, uh, the point behind this borderline rant in and of itself isn't to say the sniper rifles would be literally useless. It's to point out how his own rebalances force snipers outside of the heat maker into a playstyle that just complements the Huntsman. By comparison, the rifles are slower and struggle to be versatile unless you're good at quickscope headshots, and they no longer have the ammo reserves to properly snipe for any long period of time, unless you give up a secondary. Are max overheal heavies and the extra 30 damage on a charged body shot worth all these downsides compared to the bow? I don't think so. Alright, time to talk about a weapon that should be cool, but isn't. The Shahancha. A little extra damage when below half health and a little less when above, that's just kinda lame. It's not that impactful. So I changed each instance of 25% with... 70%. That's right, 70% more damage when low on health, 70% less damage when you're healthy. That's 111 and 20 damage respectively. 
it is truly situational now. And of course, adding that much damage to any weapon means I've gotta get rid of random crits, you know the drill, we can't have snipers one-shotting heavies with their melee, and it deploys slow and swings a little slower, so it's really not a get out of jail free card at all. You've gotta be smart if you pull this thing out or else you're toast. But even with all the downsides, I still think it'll be better, or at least more fun, than the original Shahancha. It is a guaranteed 111 damage after all. That should make any scout or spy think twice about chasing you around that corner. Buffed. And speaking of spies, let's talk about the Tribalman's Shiv. In normal TF2, it's a decent way to reveal spies, but nowhere near as good as the Jurati. So I just leaned into the bleed a little more and made it do less damage on hit with longer bleed time meaning it does 87 damage over the course of 10 seconds instead of 81 damage over the course of 6 seconds. 10 seconds is also how long I last, I mean, how long Jurati lasts, uh, you know, just for reference. 4 extra seconds to chase down a spy will definitely come in handy, but it's not really doing any extra damage. Buffed. Sniper has the worst melee selection in the entire game, with no utility options and one that clearly trumps the rest combat-wise. So if there are any weapons in the game that could do with an overhaul into something different, it's these. So naturally he doesn't. Instead we get buffs that actually just make the weapons far worse. He's right about the Shahansha, or the half and half as I call it. It's not very impactful. And unfortunately he gave it an impact alright. The damage buff already isn't that helpful because of how fragile you have to be to use it, and buffing its damage up isn't helping. Sure, that's a lot of damage, but it's not enough to one-shot a healthy light class. To be fair, the sniper can't have access to something like that because it would be broken, but I think that just showcases the flawed concept of the weapon to begin with. This weapon encourages you to bring a knife to a gunfight when you need a trip to the ER, but if it becomes too good at that, then sniper becomes too powerful at close range, something that is already a problem when random crits are enabled. However, to showcase how bad this can potentially get, let's break it down with the math. In Grouch's own custom server, a half-health Razorback Sniper will have a max of 75 health. Since melee is point-blank range, this means that any gun the class retaliates with will have max damage ramp up. The weakest primaries for both classes he recommends using this against can two-shot you in the time it takes for a single swing. Meanwhile, above half-health, you do less damage than the scout's bat, with a slower swing speed than stock, and a deploy time almost as bad as a Demo Knight Sword. He says you need to be smart with this, but it'd be smarter to stick with stock and pray for a random crit. As for the Shiv, bleed damage has become the meme of this video thanks to a certain rebalance later. For now, let's break this down. Bleed is effectively afterburn that's harder to get rid of, and it can stack if different sources inflict it on the same target. So it's a pretty good effect. On Scout. Yeah, Bleed only works well on Scout because he's fast enough to make use of hit and run tactics, and he's the only class in the game with more than one weapon that can inflict it. And even then, it's the ranged options that get use out of players. The Boston Basher is deemed very, very redundant because if you're close enough to land a Boston Bash, just shoot him with your primary gun. The same is true for the Engineer's Bleed Wrench, though that one has a little more utility, but the same cannot be true for the Shiv. As Sniper struggles at close range and needs a good melee, if only the Shiv was a good melee. Sadly, it's the worst bleed weapon in the game thanks to its base damage nerf. When the bleed runs its course, you'll only do about 16 more damage than stock. And what's worse, Spy, the only class you'll realistically ever use this thing on, naturally counters it. All forms of cloaking cut negative status effect time in half, and the Dead Ringer can get rid of it outright. And since he made the base damage so pathetically low now, the problem's only gotten even worse. These are nerfs, not buffs. Whew, alright, that was a lot of changes for just Sniper and Heavy, but I think we can all agree that those are the classes that needed them the most. These next ones will be a lot faster, like Soldier. I mean, I might be biased because he's my most played class, but I can't think of a single weapon he has that doesn't work the way it should. Moving on to Scout- <laughs> Uh, I'm just playing with you, alright? You didn't think I'd forget the weakest weapon in the game, did you? The Righteous Bison? This thing sucks. So I quadrupled its fire rate to have a kind of net-like effect where you catch enemies. You know, like you're creating a wall of projectiles rather than trying to actually aim individual shots, which proves to be completely impossible with this weapon. Now it actually has a mid-range use of pushing a sniper out of his nest or breaking up a big cluster of enemies instead of just being, you know, the fucking worst weapon in the game. 
It's still not going to be out damaging your rocket launcher though, so don't get any big ideas. It should be fun to play with though. Buffed. Yep, that's the only soldier weapon he'd rebalance. No equalizer, no man treads, no swiggy swag. Okay, Mr. Soldier Main. As for his change to the bison, I'm conflicted on it. This is easily the best rebalance the video has shown thus far, but I want to see this weapon's damage at close or point-blank range. Still, the slower firing speed was the problem, it was addressed, and he tried to make sure that it wouldn't outperform the primary. I wouldn't rubber stamp this on the spot, 4x speed might be a bit much and it probably shouldn't reload as fast as it does, but I can call this one a win. In the follow-up video he did on the Spy, he said that he would buff the Rocket Jumper of all things by giving it double firing speed and increasing the clip size to 14. Nope, I cannot agree with that. To mess around with on his server? Sure, but as a buff? No. Ignoring that Trollger is already stronger than he has any right to be, this weapon is meant to teach players to Rocket Jump without forcing them to download custom maps and or mods. That needs to be the purpose of the weapon. However, I can think of a buff that would help Trollger in a less busted way, and without directly taking away from the benefit of the weapon, giving this weapon admin reload, aka passive reload, like the flare guns get. Okay, now it's time for Scout, for real this time. Again, you might hate me for saying this, but I think Scout doesn't have a single overpowered weapon. I am making this for you guys though, so two weeks later, it's fun. And that's my only goal with this entire project. I'm not saying that all of these changes should be put in the base game or that they should be competitively viable. My server isn't a competitive server, it's 12v12 with random crits enabled. But for right now, I'm just gonna change the candy cane and call it a day. Instead of 25% more damage from explosives, which ends up making this thing too situational, I'm just gonna go all the way and give him 25 less health for equipping the item. And to balance it out and make this thing actually fun, I've made it so that the health packs enemies drop when you kill them now fully heal you, along with every other health pack in the game. Meaning as long as you don't take too much damage all at once, you could theoretically go on a total rampage with this thing. Or a, a sugar rush, if you will. Buffed. I love that he says the downside for this weapon is too situational as he comes face to face with a demo man in the very clip. But this rebalance is completely unneeded, the candy cane is fine, the health packs can be picked up by enemies, they don't heal for much in the first place especially on scout, and matches without explosive classes are absurdly rare. I do agree with the statement that scout doesn't have anything too overpowered, honestly the default scatter gun is the closest thing to that. But he certainly has plenty of weak options that could use a nudge up. The shortstop, the backscatter, the babyface's blaster, the sandman, the sun on a stick. His design document says he's since buffed the bonk atomic punch by giving it a 15% movement speed boost, but I don't know if that's in addition to the invincibility or if it's replacing it, because it wasn't mentioned in the follow-up video. And for the third class that barely gets changed, Demo Man. I'll be honest, I'm just gonna buff the shit out of the caber and move on with my life. No more damage nerf, in fact, there's a damage buff. Triple damage to buildings, you heard me. I wanna live in a world where Demo Man can charge headfirst into a distracted sentry gun and destroy everything in the vicinity, including himself. This one definitely needs playtesting, but I'm praying to god that it works the way I want it to, because this image is just hilarious to me. The next change might be considered a downside, but really it's just another upside, which is that the Demo Man's Ulapool Caber deals more damage to himself, enough to guarantee that the Demo Man dies even if he's overhealed. Now normal sane people will see this as a downside, but Caber users are not normal sane people. They don't want to live after they've lost their Caber, that's all they've got going for them, it's the only thing they care about. Dying immediately after using it just means you get to respawn quicker, which means you get your charge replenished faster, which means more cabering. It's all upsides in Caber Town. Also, it gets random crits now. Fuck you. Buffed. So let me get this straight. To buff the Caber, a Demo Man melee weapon, you tripled its damage output on buildings, on a class that basically has two primary weapons equipped at the same time by default, both of which specializing in erasing the engineer from existence. Not only that, but he claims he wants the Demo Man to destroy everything, including himself, and yet the only way he could use this against a sentry is with an uber charge. And the blast radius is still too small to reach the nearby dispenser. 
This is the worst rebalance in the video, and people tend to gloss over that. Probably because the caber isn't that good to begin with. I'm going to assume the stupidity and redundancy of the building damage buff is self-evident. So let's instead tackle the always dying on use. The problem with the caber is that it's on Demo Man, the class most vulnerable to getting rushed down. His melee is to defend himself without killing himself, otherwise he'd be better off taking his chances with the grenade launcher or sticky bombs. But the caber is slower to pull out than his swords while lacking their extra reach, and it causes massive self-damage on use, so it's only good as an offensive option. But with only one bomb per spawn, it has naturally been relegated to the self-destruct stick, and nothing about Grouch's version changes anything I just said, and instead restricts it to that one use case. But, as a card-carrying contender of the CAC, that's Caber Appreciation Committee, allow me to actually buff the shit out of this. For every buff, I'm going to give a nerf, and none of the Caber's currently existing stats will change. When deployed, the Caber would offer a 20% damage resistance, but come with a 20% knockback vulnerability. This gives Demo a better chance of surviving the journey to and delivery of his payload, but it means enemies have a better chance of knocking him away when he tries to do so. It also comes with a bomb meter, which will replenish the bomb once it's used over a period of 15 seconds. However, the meter only fills when the weapon is holstered. The meter does recover 30% faster from a dispenser, but is unaffected by ammo boxes. And finally, as a positive and negative, both the swing and explosion inflict bleeding. Bleed on a melee swing is not very good as I've established, but damage over time on a blast radius is far more viable, trading the demo man instantly dying in favor of him living on borrowed time. Ideally, this would make it a really good option for Hybrid Knight, which is already its most popular application. Oh, and you know how the Iron Bomber is like super boring and barely changes anything from the normal grenade launcher? Well, it's the Carpet Bomber now. Right, skipping over this one. Part of it is because I'm tired of his idea of a rebalance being to defile a weapon out of sheer boredom. Guess what, world? My cock's inside my car! This also showcases the problem many longtime TF2 fans have with videos like this. Why must every single weapon be drastically different? Why can't weapons be similar with niche differences? Especially the Demo Man, who already has an entire subclass devoted to his melee support. Also, that barely different Iron Bomber has a very important difference. The lack of grenade rolling. This lets the Demo Man grenade jump reliably, which is very useful if he's using any secondary besides the Scottish Resistance or the Sticky Jumper, but at the cost of his reliable indirect fire to destroy sentries around corners. I won't cover his Carpet Bomber idea. It's a separate weapon entirely, so just make it a separate weapon. And since these Demo Man buffs might bother some Engineer Mans, I'll go ahead and tell you about the Texans' new toys. The Pompson now fires faster, like the Righteous Bison but not as fast, and reloads slower. And instead of draining Uber and Cloak, it just drains twice as much Cloak now. There is just no fucking reason Engineer should be capable of single-handedly destroying an Uber push on his own goddamn century. Since spies can get a ton of Cloak from destroyed buildings, this shouldn't be too annoying for spy players unless they're using the Dead Ringer. In which case, if you don't have the Dead Ringer active, it's gonna disable it for a couple of seconds, and if you do have the Dead Ringer active, you're gonna get about, you know, one millisecond of cloak before the Engineer comes at you with his wrench. I think it's about time we saw some Dead Ringer counterplay from Engineer, don't you? Buffed. The faster firing speed with slower reload is a good call, but the rebalance of the drain effects is all off. The Medic Uber Drain is fair because the effect requires the Medic to be within 1500 hammer units for anything to even happen, the same with the Spy's Cloak. Beyond that range, nothing happens, and the percentage drops off after about 500 hammer units. For the sake of reference, the Grappling Hooks and Manpower have you travel at 1500 hammer units a second exactly. That's not much of a distance for a gun. And, the Pompson can't drain Uber Charge of any Medi Gun once the Uber has been activated. Between that and this weapon no longer having target penetration, Medic can only lose his Uber Charge by overextending, and even then only a combat engineer can realistically be close enough to do anything about it. On the other hand, saying Spy gets his cloak back from destroyed buildings doesn't mean much when NG can now ensure the Spy doesn't get away. 40% drain per hit while doubling the firing speed? How is that fair, especially to Dead Ringer spies? They already have to give up reliable standard cloak to try and fake their death, so should the engineer really be allowed to just instantly negate it? 
That's not counterplay, that's just removal. Frankly, either remove both effects and replace them with a new one, or just leave them be. Okay, time to make every engineer main watching this very angry. The jag is too strong, it just is, everyone uses it, and for good reason. The repair penalty is barely even a penalty due to the increased swing speed. I think the jag should be great at getting buildings up quick, but bad at keeping them up. So I increase the repair rate penalty from minus 25% to minus 40%. You can still use the Rescue Ranger to repair quickly, so this shouldn't be too bad, but I'm really tired of the Jag reigning supreme over all the other wrenches. Nerfed. No! No! Maybe the reason the Jag's repair rate nerf isn't as drastic is because it's not the only downside. The wrench already does 20% less damage, meaning a fully cloaked spy needs four swings to be killed thanks to the extra damage resistance of cloak. And the 30% less damage to buildings means sappers on everything can be a nightmare. It's hardly a downside, because it's hardly the only downside. And Grouch's version now sucks at the most basic job an engineer has. I don't even need to break down what's wrong with it, because his own video shows it. A single soldier could take down a level 3 sentry, be intended by the engineer, with a single clip of the stock rocket launcher. It isn't bad at keeping up your buildings, it is incapable of doing so. And if equipping the Rescue Ranger is meant to be the solution, the Engineer now has to give up his self-defense capabilities just to do what Stock does naturally. No thank you. But I'm really tired of the Jag reigning supreme over all the other wrenches. Nerfed. Hopefully this change will give other wrenches a chance, like the Southern Hospitality. It's my personal favorite and the one I always use. No spy expects you to pull this thing out, so it's hilarious to smack him in the face with crazy damage and watch him squirm away bleeding. I think it's honestly one of the most underrated weapons in TF2, and hopefully with this Jag change, that will stop being the case. The Southern Hospitality remains unchanged. The universal question is, why bring up this weapon if nothing has changed? That's why I replayed the end of the Jag section. The Jag wasn't nerfed because it was actually broken, but because he was tired of it being the fan favorite. So allow me to explain why turning the Jag into the worst wrench wouldn't save the SH. The bleed on hit isn't too bad, as the wrench doesn't have a damage nerf like the shiv does. The tracking of a cloak spy is okay, but the bleed's real strength is that, even when the cloak's damage resistance is kept in mind, the bleed will be able to do enough damage to make up for it, and then some. However, the downside is that you take 20% more fire damage, meaning you're screwed if a pyro happens to be what pushes into your nest. This is especially dangerous on maps where ground level sentries are the best option. However, Neither of those stats have to be in play. Like, the scout's candy cane will realistically always be a factor, because outside of MVM, you're hardly ever going to find a match without a soldier or demo man. But it's possible to never directly face off with a pyro when level geometry favors you, and you can realistically never whack a spy with your wrench, be it because he dies before reaching you, backstabs you before you realize he's there, saps and gets away, or you just use your shotgun. You know what you will always have to deal with, though? No random crits. And I know that matters to him, because he buffed the kamikaze baton to have them, and that he mentions he plays with them on in his follow-up video. Melee weapons have a default 15% random crit chance, and that can rise up to 60% if the player has dealt 800 damage in the past 20 seconds with any weapon, buildings included. For Engineer, this means that after people die to his sentry, he realistically has a two-thirds chance to instantly cave some poor man's skull in with a single swing. Trading that away for bleed damage is just not worth it for most people, even before the allergic reaction to pyros is considered. He also said in his follow-up video he would nerf the Wrangler to have a 30% damage vulnerability because he doesn't think the downside actually affects him. I disagree. The only thing that stops Engie from being weak to being rushed down is his shotgun and the sentry's auto-fire, and you have to give both of those up for manual control. From any sniper primary to Pyro's flare gun two-hit comboing you, to a scout simply running around you in your sentry, to a demo knight charge, there's plenty of things that can provide trouble for an NG with his Wrangler if he isn't careful, especially given that your sentry goes down for a few seconds if you swap. Yes, it's powerful, but it's riskier than he gives it credit for. Alright, now it's spy time, and these changes are my favorite. Is that a threat? Remember when I said that a select few weapons in TF2 are legitimately overpowered? Well, my friend, most of them belong to spy. First, the diamondback, which gets you a full-blown crit every time you stab someone or sap a building. 
You might think of it as similar to the Frontier Justice, but they are actually exact opposites. The Frontier Justice gives you crits when your sentry gets destroyed based on how many kills it had, meaning as an engineer, your damage only goes up immediately after your damage and defenses went down. One goes up, one goes down. Yin and yang, push and pull, that's called game balance. The Diamondback doesn't fucking do that at all. It increases your damage when their damage gets decreased. You get crits when their heavy gets stabbed, when their sentry goes down. Being an engineer with a destroyed nest already sucks, but being an engineer with a destroyed nest sitting next to a spy with four insta-kill bullets in his gun is much, much worse. I'm all for snowball weapons that reward you for doing well, but look at the Islander or the Bizarre Bargain for instance. These take time to snowball. You have to really prioritize survival to see any benefits from these weapons. The Diamondback doesn't even encourage survival. It's like, well, I have all my crits now, I guess it's time to fucking use my ultimate ability by running headfirst into the enemy team, killing three random people, and then dying immediately. That isn't the role of a stealth class, that's fucking Reaper from Overwatch. I'm fine with this being the damage gun, but Jesus Christ, that's just too much damage. You know what's funny? He claims the Diamondback buffs Spy after he wins, while the Frontier Justice only does so when the NG loses, but he fails to acknowledge that in his own hypothetical they would both get crits at the same time. But never mind that. His argument about game design is literally wrong. The Frontier Justice calls them revenge crits for a reason. The Sentry has to get kills first. The Engineer gets crits when their heavy goes down, and their medic, and the scout and pyro that wander in front of it mindlessly, and the soldier that overextended while blast jumping. Sure, the sentry has to be destroyed for them to be received, but it still means you only get it after their power goes down or you stall the team out. And it gives a buffer for when the Engineer dies. If the sentry stays up in his absence, he can get the crits if it goes down after his respawn. Spy, on the other hand, gets them instantly, but loses them upon death. So yeah, these two weapons are actually quite similar, and their differences are to account for them being on different classes. That goes double for comparing it to the proper snowball weapons. Spy is too fragile of a class for a proper snowball weapon to work. And his claim about not encouraging survivability is flat out wrong. If a spy is a moron, he'll do what he said, but a smart spy will save those crits for when he needs to make an escape, or pick off a target he cannot safely backstab. And the situation he shows in the video of having nearly 20 crits saved? You'll probably never see that happen because, as he himself says in the original bit, most players are too paranoid and observant for Spy to get away with that much. The Spy's disguise kit already makes the enemy team not trust their teammates and not want to get near them because they might get backstabbed. He literally had the farm crits off of a friendly enemy engineer just to make his point look valid here. Most spies are lucky to see a full magazine's worth of stock crits. That's probably why they buffed this weapon to give two per kill. Ugh, I could go on. There's a lot wrong with this section, but you get the idea. Talks about game design while cherry-picking the actual design, and just straight up ignoring game sense. Complains about situation most players never get to experience. Justifies reworking something popular for really weak reasoning. <sighs> Alright, uh, let's actually hear his rebalance. Not the one in the original video, but his new one he gave in the follow-up. Let's talk Diamond Pack. In my last video, I changed it into the Diamond Back-to-Back, -back, making it a normal revolver with two shots and the benefit of getting one second of crits on a successful kill. I loved the idea for this weapon at the time, and I still love the idea for it, but you guys pointed out that it is incredibly weak. I buffed it by giving it the normal six shots with a slower firing speed and damage penalty. Every shot is 100% accurate though, so it allows a highly skilled spy to go on a killing spree if he's able to get that initial kill and stay safe afterwards. As with all of the weapons, this is not a finalized version. I expect it to need thorough playtesting and will more than likely be tweaked by the next video. Buffed. That sounds weak. It'd be balanced, I crunched the numbers and nothing came back as concerning. But that lower base damage means damage drop-off is gonna be brutal at any range where you can take advantage of that perfect accuracy. And at close to mid-range, it's just a less reliable stock and a weaker ambassador. Oh, as an aside, in the follow-up video on the Spy, he says he wants to revert the changes of the ambassador back to pre-Jungle Inferno, specifically to counter his version of the Danger Shield. No. Absolutely not. By his own logic. 
If Sniper is not meant to be a stealth class, the stealth class doesn't get to snipe. Maybe don't give the Huntsman a high jump. Anyway, there's a very simple way to nerf the Diamondback, and nerf it pretty harshly. Make it so it can't fire while disguised. This means a spy can no longer pop out of his disguise using a 120 damage shot, and who knows how many more he has saved up. He has to lose the element of surprise first. This encourages the spy to use those crits as a combo extender after a chain stab, as a kill tool for a target that's hard to reach, or as a means to deter slash kill enemies while in retreat. But, and this is the big thing, it also means Spy can't just start firing his revolver when backing up if he's caught mid-disguise, a very powerful option for the class being removed. But such is, or at least should be, the high cost of crits. Alright, moving on to Spy's other broken weapon, the Conniver's Kunai. Here's how the old version worked, or didn't work, rather. You sneak around with low health until you get a backstab, and upon a successful backstab, immediately gain a ton of health to help you escape. The problem here is that, and this may come as a surprise to you, Spy can go invisible, so avoiding taking damage before a backstab is actually not that hard, almost inevitable, for any half-decent Spy player. The health gain on a backstab, however, is incredibly useful, significantly protecting the Spy after getting a kill, especially when used in combination with the Dead Ringer. The weapon's downside does not have as big of an impact as its upside, by definition making it unbalanced. And here's another shocking revelation, Spy is not a tank, giving him the health pool of a pyro or demo man anytime he's in danger distances him from his core design mechanic of stealth. Cause who needs stealth when you can take two rockets to the face like they're stale Cheetos? And to top it all off, we already have a knife that helps Spy escape after backstabs, the Big Earner which is more interesting, more fun to play against, and more fun to use. I love when he says that the downside is not as impactful as the upside. He gets one shot by a demo man while he tries to backstab a pyro for the health. Frankly, there's a lot of contradiction in this section. He says that invisibility is what pushes this to be overpowered, but then says it pairs best with the Dead Ringer, which does not give you invisibility on command. He says it removes him from his role as a stealth class, but also claims his stealth is what invalidates said downside. And in case Grouch forgot, there's a class in the game that perfectly counters Spy's cloak. Activating insane spy checker mode. He says you can just tank rockets, but in the clip he only survives with 20 health. That's not tanking, that's scraping by. And it's only because you fought a bot. A human player could have simply fired a third rocket and killed you with splash damage. And a scout spy checking you with his bat would have finished the job in one swing. The kunai demands a spy to be on point with a stealth game, aka being a really good stealth class, and rewards him with temporary durability that decays with time, and cannot be earned any other way beyond the spy's backstab. His own footage shows how quickly 200 health can be shaven down by a power class. This leads to a problem people ignore about the kunai and the spy hard set as a whole. It has a bad case of survivorship bias. Everyone has their kunai campfire story of a spy achieving more than he normally would because of the overheal, especially if the diamondback was involved. And it's hard not to see it as him being rewarded for just playing spy. But do you think about all the times a kunai spy got caught without that overheal, and dies in less than a second? Or all the times a diamondback's damage nerf makes him unable to secure a kill on target without the crits? Or when the spy turns off his dead ringer only to learn he wasn't alone in that hallway? This is why spy mains get so frustrated at calls to nerf the tryhard set. All the weapons offer the highest highs, but are the most demanding. The kunai gives you excellent durability for a short time after a kill, but you have to dance on eggshells until you get that first kill, and your extra health is use it or lose it. The Diamondback gives the Spy the damage output to make game-ending plays if he can land his shots, but he needs to do his job first, live to tell the tale, and can't choose which shots do and don't crit. The Dead Ringer gives Spy some much-needed mistake allowance at the cost of him being fully exposed trying to get behind enemy lines, and not being on demand like the other watches. Most people calling for nerfs never keep this in mind, Probably because it's hard just to play stock spy, let alone Dante must spy mode. 
Oh, uh, the reason I've been giving these history lessons before the actual changes with the spy section is because I want to emphasize what would be removed independent of the buff for these. Since he makes such a big deal about weapons being boring, and yet removes some of the only unique playstyle spy gets. So what did I do about the kunai? Um, well, I might have actually made it worse. Um, please do not hate me for this. I turned it into a throwing knife. You what? Just hear me out, okay? It was already one of the most unbalanced weapons in the game, right? So I'm willing to get experimental and try out this potentially crazy overpowered design. I think it'll work, but I could see it totally blowing up in our face. It's just a little more melee range. That's it, right? You've still only got 70 health with no health regen, plus it deploys a little slower too. It it could be balanced, right? I mean, maybe, who the hell knows? Nothing like this has really been tried before for Spy. But remember all those cool throwing knife designs on the Steam Workshop? Didn't you ever wonder what could have been? The kunai already looks like a throwing knife, I just took it a step further and actually made it one. I'll be honest, the rest of the balance changes I've made in this are, you know, based on logic, based on experience, based on good design principles. I have 35 minutes of evidence to the contrary. But this one, I just kind of vibed out. I'm sorry if it sucks, we can always change it later if we need to. Nerfed, I hope? Credit to Grouch for saying this one was an experiment. But he doubles down on it in the follow-up, so it's fair game. First, that's not a throwing knife. That's a Dark Souls hitbox. Second, Maybe those throwing knives from the Steam Workshop were never added for a reason? Third, didn't you say earlier that people didn't mind getting backstabbed compared to headshot from a sniper because the spy needs to be good at positioning? Fourth, if the spy wanted to kill that sniper, he had a gun. Fifth, you know kunais weren't throwing knives, right? That's something Naruto did because it's cool. But kunais are farming tools meant to poke seed-sized holes in the ground. They just happen to be really good at scaling walls and stabbing people. Sixth, stop making completely separate weapons and calling them a rebalance. This isn't the Sandman stun, it's not that game-breaking. Alright, time to get back to the realm of reality. The Enforcer is pointless, and it's time for it to be changed. Forget everything you know about the Enforcer. I'd like to introduce you to Le Executeur. You'll never guess what that's French for. With this thing, you've got one bullet per clip, less damage, less reserve ammo, and two times slower reload speed. Pretty good so far, huh? It only has one upside, too. On hit, bleed for 8 seconds. That's 64 damage, way less DPS than the normal revolver. You might be thinking that it'd be impossible to get any meaningful kills with this thing, and you know, you'd probably be right. But maybe you don't need to. Hit a sniper with this bullet, and he'll bleed for 8 seconds, taking up to 64 damage if he doesn't find a health pack. Yeah, that's less damage than shooting him with the normal revolver. But this isn't about damage. The sniper will be bleeding for 8 seconds, which means flinching for 8 seconds. Are you starting to get the picture? Sniper already has the ability to disable Spy's cloak for 10 seconds with the Jurati or the Tribalman's Shiv, and now the Executor turns the tables. It lets Spy disable Sniper's aim for 8 whole seconds. But don't worry Snipers, you can always equip the Cozy Camper to avoid flinching if this becomes a real problem. Buffed. Two weeks later. The Enforcer, which was by far the worst part of my last video, I can admit that. I honestly thought I was buffing this thing by giving it a one-shot bleed ability to counter snipers, but I accidentally just nerfed the hell out of it instead. You guys made that very clear in the comments, so I'll just go on the record and say, oops. We're changing it completely into a close quarters fan the hammer style weapon to allow Spy to better defend himself in close range while weakening him at mid range. Basically, it's the normal revolver, except now it fires twice as fast at the cost of less accuracy over time and a slower reload speed. Now this might seem pretty strong, and it is, but remember that if a spy sneaks up to you at close range, there is another weapon he could use that would typically be more effective than his revolver. I'll let you think for a second and try and guess what that weapon is. Now, since Spy can't backstab sentries, this gun will be especially effective in taking down buildings, which was one of the primary uses of the old Enforcer. And for all you math whizzes out there, these stats come together to form a 23% increase in damage per second over the normal revolver. However, this can be further capitalized on with correct cloak usage since Spy can technically reload while cloaked as long as he begins reloading before he cloaks. 
buffed. So for his retrain of the Enforcer in the follow-up, this one is... interesting. The ability to destroy buildings faster is useful, but it makes the revolver worse at actually picking off targets, since mid-range is when Spy relies on his revolver the most. While this does fit the role of a side grade, and it's one that I could even see some spies using, I do think that the accuracy is a bit too bad. I don't think people would be upset if this was brought into the game, but it's definitely not how I would fix this weapon. Now, the reason I showed the original bit is not just because of how much of a meme it's become, but ironically, because the bleed on hit wasn't a bad idea. The problem was that it was the sole damage dealer instead of a damage bonus. Do you want to know how much a 20% damage bonus is on stock revolver? 8. You want to know how much damage per second bleed causes? You could simply replace the 20% damage bonus when disguised, with a stacking 1 second of bleed on hit any time, and have a more balanced version of the old Enforcer. Just a thought, though. Anyway, the follow-up spy video has quite a few ideas in it, so let's rapid-fire through them. He suggested that the spy should be able to sprint while disguised, as in, removing any speed nerfs his current persona has. This is fair, I would just have it be toggled by holding down reload instead of jump. He also has the Your Eternal Reward, make the spy cloak and uncloak faster. This is also fair, given how demanding the knife is of the player. The final suggestion he made in that video that I haven't covered is the red tape recorder no longer doing any damage, but in turn taking four swings to be removed. This is an interesting idea for A Sapper, like, if Overwatch 2 got cross-promotion weapons in TF2, and the Spy got a Sapper based on Sombra, this could work as a baseline. But as a rebalance of the red tape, it's just making the problem worse, like the Hulong Heater rebalance did. The red tape's issue is that it can't do enough damage to help with a push. If you're gonna make it so it does no damage, but lasts twice as long, why not just keep it as it is, but give it 50% more health to require a third swing? That just seems like a much simpler solution. And how can we talk about Spy without discussing Pyro? And what would a Pyro discussion be if we didn't bring up everybody's favorite flamethrower, the Phlogistonator? This weapon is going to be... unchanged. Because I don't think the Phlogistonator is the guilty party here. The Flog is the Fall Guy. The real culprit is the Scorch Shot. This thing sucks to play against. All a pyro has to do is aim in the general direction of the enemy team and left click, and within moments his flog meter will now be filled up and ready to go. No more, I say. I'm gonna totally turn this thing upside down. Meet the new Scorch Shot, or as I call it, the Firefly. Wait, 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 don't click off the video. I know it looks terrible. I know it looks like total bullshit, but I promise it's not that bad. These flares barely do any damage. It's all just in the afterburn. And look at them. They don't move very fast at all either. And good luck trying to actually aim the damn thing. They go all over the place. The point of this weapon is to let Pyro do what the Scorch Shot was already making the Pyro do, which is to just aim in the general direction of the enemy team and hold down left click, but with a better result. Armageddon fire on big groups of enemies to cause maximum chaos from a distance. It's not actually gonna kill anybody. Imagine raining down Armageddon on an enemy push while a couple Huo Long Heater heavies sit behind you ready to pick off anybody hit by the flares. Or imagine just shooting a couple of these bad boys into a room, running in with the extinguisher, and just praying to god that one of them hit something. These new flares, or fireflies, are really just an inconvenient distraction. They're not hard to dodge at all if you're paying attention to them but you do have to pay attention to them. I really think this will still manage to be less annoying than the old Scorch Shot. Maybe that makes me look like an idiot, but I don't care. Nerfed. And remember, like with all of the weapons, if it totally sucks, we can always just change it. This next one though, I'm pretty confident in. The Sharpened Volcano Fragment. This is, and I've thought this for like 11 years, the coolest looking weapon in Team Fortress 2. Which sucks, because it is by far the stupidest fucking weapon in Team Fortress 2. The Volcano Fragment ignites enemies on hit, which is pretty sick, until you think about the fact that the Pyro has a fucking flamethrower. If you're in a melee range of an enemy, you are 10 out of 10 times better off to just use the flamethrower. The point of the class. It does more damage, it has better range, it can air blast, and it will also light them on fire. This thing is completely useless outside of medieval mode. But what if we really leaned into the damage over time mechanic of Afterburn? It is the sharpened Volcano Fragment after all. And what do sharp things do? That's right, 
they make you bleed. So now instead of just igniting enemies, the Volcano Fragment will also make them bleed, meaning they'll be taking 16 damage a second for 6 seconds after you hit them with this, for a total of 129 damage. This may seem overpowered, but let me remind you, this is still significantly less damage per second than the normal flamethrower, which can kill a light class in less than 2 seconds if the pyro is aiming properly. And let me also remind you that the original Volcano Fragment did 100 damage after 6 seconds, and nobody thought that was unfair. So this change really isn't that crazy. It'll definitely send enemies into a panic though, seeing their health draining that quickly. Especially a medic or light class. Buffed. If the goal was to make the Squirt Shot less brain dead and building up Flog Charge, just cut its fire and afterburn damage by 75%. Or just remove the explosion when it hits the map and make it have to bounce off an enemy to explode. If Flog Pyro is legit the only reason this already mediocre weapon needs to be nerfed, both of these are far more natural changes without allowing him to shut down an entire choke point. Especially if more than one Pyro on the team decides to wield this. As for the Sharpened Volcano Fragment, I wondered why Valve never added bleed to it, until I did the math. One second of bleed and afterburn would bring it up to 68 damage after a single second, making it effectively on par with stock with a damage over time effect, thus actually making it a direct buff. Valve is very hesitant to directly buff a weapon. The Pyro Zone 3rd Degree is the only direct upgrade in the game officially, and it's so absurdly niche that it's arguably a downgrade in terms of player habits. If Valve were to add it, this already weak weapon would have to be nerfed in other ways to compensate for the bleed. From a player perspective, however, the Sharpened Volcano Fragment, even with bleed, is just outclassed. Most Pyros looking for a combat melee will rock the Backscratcher for the flat 25% extra damage. The downside of less health from healers isn't too bad, since Pyros are looking for health packs before medics anyway. The Extinguisher combos with the Flamethrower instead of being made redundant by it, the Power Jack gives a powerful boost in speed to catch up with enemies, and Stock just does more reliable damage. The damage over time, on the other hand, actually punishes you for landing multiple shots in a row because the timer resets instead of stacking, so you lose out on that hypothetical damage you would have done while still dealing the lower base damage. They could balance the bleed idea by making it so it inflicts bleed on burning targets, but it still wouldn't push this weapon to be strong enough as a combat tool, and would still be lacking in any strong utility options, bringing us back to square one. Also seriously, no gas passer? Speaking of Medic, he's got a couple new toys too. I'll start by talking about the Quick Fix, which in my opinion is the most underrated weapon in this entire game. I love this thing, it's basically the only medigun I use, it's fun as hell, good as hell, and it's gonna remain unchanged. I want to make a whole video on this thing sometimes because I don't think anybody truly appreciates what it does for this game. Alright, now for the real changes. The Vaccinator. We all know this thing is overpowered. The 75% damage resistance that Ubers provide combined with overheal essentially increases the medic's patient's health by 600%. To put that in perspective, an overhealed heavy with the Vaccinator Uber has a functional 1800 health against whatever damage type the medic chooses. That's basically just an Uber charge, except you get four of them and they charge twice as fast. If the medic's patient is somehow fighting a soldier, pyro, and scout all at the same time, then yeah, the damage resistances aren't going to block everything. But most of the time, it's pretty easy for the medic to see what resistance is needed at any given moment and switch to it. You basically win any possible 2v1 with the click of a button. This whole item needs a serious makeover. I'm completely getting rid of the damage type resistances and replacing it with a single invulnerability uber charge that lasts a little less than one second. Enough time to absorb a rocket, meat shot, headshot, or sticky trap if timed well. The Uber meter charges 500% faster to balance this out, taking about 8 seconds to fully charge instead of the normal 40. I want this Uber to feel like a defensive parry instead of like a full hand of get out of jail free cards. And as for the healing itself, I leaned into the vaccination theme of the weapon by giving it an 80% reduced overheal that never depletes. For reference, this will give an overhealed soldier a permanent 220 health. Until he takes damage, of course, in which case he'll need to be overhealed again. I want it to feel like you're vaccinating your teammates for the upcoming battle and having the survivors run back to you to get their booster shots once the overheal has been taken away by the enemies. I think this will be more fun, more unique, and most importantly, a lot less powerful. Nerfed. The quick fix honestly does need a buff or two. 
Every medigun now gives the medic a speed boost when he's healing a scout, so the only mobility option the quick fix now gives is rocket jumping with soldiers. The vaccinator has completely replaced it because, unlike the quick fix, its ubercharge allows you to survive attacks you normally can't. That's the big weakness of the quick fix, its inability to prevent lethal burst damage, which is unfortunately the biggest threat to any medic combo. It leaves it fairly weak compared to the other three mediguns. Meanwhile, you made the Vaccinator just a worse version of the current Quick Fix. Preventing a single soldier rocket from killing them isn't gonna help. This isn't Paper Mario, the counterattack won't magically end the soldier's turn. He has four rockets in the chamber at any given time. At best, the Uber will stop two of his rockets. All the while, the overheal is so low that a Huntsman arrow to the head can now kill a max overhealed heavy. And those effectively invincible ubers the VAC currently gives only last two and a half seconds as it is. This strikes me as the nerfing it because I don't want to deal with it anymore kind of change that we saw back with Sniper. As for the VAC being OP, you know it has a massive weakness, right? Melee weapons and attacks that don't have designated damage types ignore the VAC's resistances, so shields only work on their designated type. I wouldn't be surprised if Valve added this community weapon to give melee weapons use as weapons. This gives several classes a means to directly bypass the damage resistance of the Vaccinator. Spy and Demo Man are the obvious choices, since backstabs and crit charges can one-shot the medic. Scout has bleeding projectiles that are untyped damage, allowing him to get anywhere from 65 to 95 damage with 80 bleed damage over time if both hit, since the bleed stacks on itself. From there, the 75% bullet resistance won't be able to save medic from even Scout's weakest primaries and the bleed damage. Heavy isn't a great matchup when it comes to something like this, but if there was ever a time to go buffalo boxing, this is it. Soldier can try to market guard in the medic for a one-shot kill, and, and it allows him to escape and try again with ease if he's good at rocket jumping, especially with the rocket jumper or liberty launcher. Pyro is especially well equipped. The back scratcher can kill the medic in two hits, the extinguisher can one-shot the medic if done after applying full three seconds of afterburn with the flamethrower, the gas passer with the neon sign can achieve this thanks to the summer update, and in some situations, the pyro can just air blast the medic away. If the vac still needs to be nerfed, let's instead just buff other weapons. Allow pure laser weapons like the cow mangler, bison, and pompson to pierce damage resistances. And now for the syringe guns, or as I call them, the syringe guns. Boo! They're all getting changed, starting with the stock syringe gun. I really wanted to avoid changing stock weapons, but this one is just so incredibly terrible that it pretty much forced my hand here. I think a plus 10% faster firing speed and plus 20% faster deploy time will give it that little extra kick it needs to be a defensive tool for anyone popping up in your face. Buff. And as for evasive tools, we've got the new overdose. The old overdose used to increase your move speed while equipped based on your uber charge percentage, which is kind of cool but mostly pointless because if you have full uber charge, you're probably going to be keeping your medigun out in case you need to pop it, making the overdose's speed boost completely null. I removed this whole uber charge percentage thing and just gave it a flat 15% speed boost and 20% jump height bonus while equipped which kind of fits with the name because it's like the medic is taking drugs. The Blute Sauger gets a simple change. Killing enemies makes them drop a small health pack in addition to its normal stats. Buffed. The stock syringe gun doesn't need its DPS increased. It's already capable of killing a heavy in 3 seconds, provided it has enough ammo loaded in. That extra 10% DPS isn't going to make a difference, and frankly the DPS of 100 and the stock swap speed isn't the issue. It's the fact that the projectiles aren't aligned with the hitbox, and the fact that they're heavily affected by gravity. The former really should have been fixed by now, while the latter sadly needs to be in place. The needles need to droop to encourage you to only use the syringe gun when retreating from an advancing enemy, instead of acting like Medic has a machine gun. The game really wants the Medic to stick to his Medigun if he's not in immediate danger. That's why the crossbow is damn near useless at close range, both in healing and fighting enemies. I'd also wager that's why the overdose is tied to the uber charge. If you want to get that speed boost, do your job first. The faster movement and jump speeds by default undermines the speed boost of healing a scout too if you ask me. And does the Blood Saga really need extra help in healing the medic? It's already easily the best of the three syringe guns. I do have some ideas for how to buff the syringe guns, and it's with the uber charge. Namely, allow each one to interact with it, besides the crossbow since it's already pretty powerful. 
The stock syringe gun, as well as the bone saw, can have the effects of the uber be carried to the weapons. So, for example, you can use it with a crits krieg for critical hits, be invincible while under a stock uber, etc, etc. The overdose instead gains the full speed boost of 20% when the uber is active, while granting mini crits for the weapon. And, when you put the medigun away and pull out the overdose, the uber consumption rate is cut in half, allowing you to take advantage of those benefits longer. The Blood Saga wouldn't gain any benefits from Uber being deployed, and instead earn Uber Charge by dealing damage. Specifically 1% Uber Charge for every 4 needles that land into an opponent. By tying the buffs around the Uber Charge, it encourages even battle medics to still be a medic. Which leads pretty naturally into the next change, the Vita Saw. Let's just be real, this thing is so stupid. You can hit an enemy to preserve 15% of your Uber Charge on death, but why would you do that if you could just equip the uber saw and get a 25% boost in your uber immediately? It's encouraging the medic to make risky melee plays, but instead of rewarding him with extra survivability like the uber saw does, it just makes dying a little bit less punishing. But you're way less likely to die in the first place if you just stay back with your medigun instead of running in with the vita saw. It's totally counterintuitive, so I'm changing it completely. It gets a minus 20% firing speed, just like with the Uber Saw, but instead of gaining Uber on hit, you gain health on kill. A good bit of health too, a whopping 100. And it can overheal you too, like the old Kunai. In combination with the Blue Sauger, I think we'll finally have a truly interesting Battle Medic subclass. But I don't think that will be the Vita Saw's only purpose. In combination with the Overdose, you could run in quick, nab some overheal off a weak target, and switch back to the Overdose to get the heck up on out of there. The same maneuver that you might do with the Uber Saw, but for a very different result. Buffed. And so that's pretty much it. And the video ends on a high note. I agree with this one. The problem he states is a very real one, the snowball effect doesn't complement medic in a combat sense, and the idea of the medic being able to get health and even overheal on kill is fair. While I like the idea of a snowball weapon for medic, and would like to see one try to be implemented effectively, this change could be added to the game right now and there wouldn't be any problem. And thus the video ends. The professional TF2 buddy of mine actually wonders if this video is trolling, and he says it reminds him of the TF2 reddit and just how out there the ideas here get. Grouch says in his follow-up spy video that he regrets calling this video fixing TF2's weapons, when they were more of experiments in his eyes. So why didn't I reproach this response as him being experimental? Because it's not just the title that gave people that impression, the comparison to fix TF2, the insistence that these changes follow good game design better than the current weapon incarnations, changing weapons for being too boring when they have niche but important uses, adding things that contradict his own design principles. There were problems well beyond the title that caused the negative backlash, and I think that was worth addressing. However, Grouch's professionalism to the blowback is respectable. What he chooses to do with this video, if anything, is up to him. But regardless, I hope this video showed that even TF2's weaker weapons aren't useless, that its OP weapons often have weaknesses, and the effort that goes into making meaningful balance changes. It's often a lot harder than stat manipulation. For those who are curious, I do have other video responses in the pipeline, but this is not going to be a regular thing. As I said at the start, I need a subject matter beyond the individual to cover if I'm going to make a response. Finally, as a request in a bit of good faith, I have something I'd like Grouch to try on his server. It's, of course, for the Schwicky Schwag, also known by its peasant name of the Liberty Launcher. This weapon has several upsides with one crippling downside, that being it basically can't kill people. <laughs> However, the appeal of the Rocket Launcher is its spammability instead of its lethality, while not being nearly as unwieldy as the Beggars. So I say, let's treat it like the Beggars on a x10 server and just stuff as many positive effects into it as possible. Plus 20% reload speed, plus 20% weapon swap speed, 15% blast radius on buildings, rocket jumping removing negative status effects like a demo night charge. My vision for this awful piece of tubing is that it has the most amount of positive traits with one downside that makes people reconsidering using it. Please Grouch, for me, unlock the scorch shot deep with inside the Schwicky Schwag.